Today we're going to talk about marketing. Last class we talked about green marketing and green programs. We talked about issues as it relates to social responsibility and ethics. What are the two um, major case studies that we examined as it relates to ethical decision making and social responsibility? Andre? About the cause, accountable. Exactly. So we looked at the decision making process of the company that manufactured the cars that would explode when it was rear ended and the cost benefit analysis that they did and how Tylenol took a very different approach to dealing with the tampering of their product in 1982 when they discovered that their Tylenol capsules were laced with cyanide. And the Corvair company, they decided instead of recalling the cars, they decided that it would be cheaper to pay the death claims. And we talked about whether or not that's uh, ethical or not, and the implications of uh, their decision. And contrasted that with the way Tylenol handled a crisis in their organization very different approaches. The Johnson & Johnson Company, before they even knew what was going on, um, or, or I should say, before they even knew whether or not they were responsible for what had um, transpired, they agreed to recall the product at a substantial cost to the company. So it wasn't for them, it wasn't a question of whether it was legal or illegal. To them it was a question of their social responsibility to their stakeholders. Maybe the car company wanted to do it too, but it's just that if they did it, they were like bankrupt at the time, maybe they had enough money to do it, that's why they did it. Well, that's, yeah, that's one of the issues that uh, come out of this type of discussion is profit, the impact on profit. And I don't think it's profit, it's the ability to do it. Like, maybe the car company didn't have the ability to do it, that's why they didn't do it. So, but, so what do you think about that? Does that, in terms of how we judge them, should we, because let's say they didn't have the money, right? That paying, the, um, paying for the recall would have bankrupt the company. Does that mean it's okay that they not recall the company, oh, the, the product? So only companies that can afford to um, conduct a recall on defective products should be required to do so. But if you can't afford to recall your product, then you shouldn't be required to. Well, I don't think it's required, but it's like, time will have two choices. They either recalled it or they didn't, and they'd still you know, go on. But the car company had no choice, so it wasn't really a, a decision. It was just you had one choice. Because I don't think anyone wanted to bank them, like in a lot of business. So the only choice they had was to pay off the death claims. Well, I, don't, I don't think they two can. Maybe it's the money issue that them two cannot be compared, I guess. Well, that's what I was trying to help us think through is is that something that we should consider? The financial component. Either it's right or it's wrong. What, you know, why, what does money have to do with the. The decision. A lot. That, like for Tylenol, um, for them it wasn't about the money. They didn't even know if they were legally responsible for what happened. The car company, at the point that they were making the decision, they knew that they manufactured a car that was defective. And when the car was rear ended, the car would explode and the people um, in the car would get killed. And yet they still um, decided that they would pay death claims instead of recalling the car, even though they knew that it was, it was their fault. The Johnson & Johnson, they recalled the product. It was a significant cost to them, but they did it because they believed that that was the right thing to do at any cost.
But time and time again, we come back to the cost component. That always seems to creep into the discussion when we think about making decisions and trying to decide what's the right decision. Somehow it seems that we fall into the trap of, and as good business people, the cost of the decision versus what is the ethical thing to do. What is, our, what is a responsible thing to do? Whether it's legal or not. Or whether it's illegal or not, because as we discussed yesterday, for some executives, that doesn't seem to be much of a deterrent either. Right? Forget about, while we sit here thinking about, is it ethical? Is it unethical? Do they have a social responsibility? We're assuming, when we talk about that, that that the issue has already been determined to be legal. But as we saw, there's quite a few decisions that have been exposed over the last six months, over the last year, made by executives that were clearly illegal, but that didn't stop them from doing it. Yeah, I wonder why. That's a good question. Why? Why did they? Why did they do it? Have you ever experienced that you have a make a decision that involves financial impact, and it's easier to be do the wrong thing than do the right thing, which is going to cost you an arm and a leg? Yes. Yeah, that's why I'm trying to um, because to get right. because like it's easier to say. It's easier for us to sit in here and say, all right, this is the wrong thing for you to do. You know, you shouldn't do that. You know, you shouldn't put a price tag on someone's life. But, you know, on the other hand, he's a, he has a responsibility about the life and death of the company. And even worse, maybe he loses his job, then next thing you know is he, he might run into, uh, you know, financial difficulties to support his family. And he, all, all these kind of things surrounding him based on one decision and I don't know I feel bad for the guy who got stuck in the situations like that but so do you feel bad for these um, car manufacturers right in this case these it's not bad luck they designed engineered and manufactured a car that would explode on impact why should we why should we feel bad for them it's not like they were at the See, the wrong thing, place at the wrong right. time. The, the, they were negligent, right? They, maybe they even designed it that way because they thought it would save them cost in the manufacturing process, which is different from um, how Tylenol dealt with the situation. Is Sure, they knew that there was a financial component, but they said, we're not going to be driven by the financial impact. They said, we have an obligation. We have an obligation to the community in which we operate our business, to our customers, to doctors, to nurses, and yes, they said we have an obligation to our shareholders, which when we talk about um, shareholder uh, responsibility, specifically we're talking about the responsibility of the company to generate profit. And they say we recognize that, but they said the responsibility to generate profit for the owners of the company is less than the responsibility than we have, than, that we have to our customers who are dying because our product is tainted with cyanide. But admittedly, it's, it's a complex decision-making process. There's certainly, there's, there's lots of implications. Why do executives do um, the things that they do now is because they're motivated by short-term rewards, which in most cases that has to do with stock price on Wall Street. So they're not thinking, what are the implications five years out for the company or ten years out? They're just thinking about what impact it's going to have this quarter to their quarterly financials. Like think about, for example, Mercedes-Benz. Mercedes-Benz invested billions of dollars, not millions, 
billions of dollars, many billions of dollars, to position their brand as a high-end luxury vehicle, right? And the S500 is a vehicle that sold for 85000 They have vehicles that are branded Mercedes that are selling for $100,000 and more. Then they decided, in their infinite wisdom, that they would sell a Mercedes for $30,000. You can't be all things to, to all people. But why did they do that? From a marketing perspective, what they did was breathtakingly stupid. From a manufacturing standpoint, what they did was really brilliant. Because their challenge, what had a stranglehold on them, was they had this excess capacity. In manufacturing, you can't be profitable operating your manufacturing facility three days a week, four days a week. Because you have a tremendous fixed cost in your business with your manufacturing facility, your distribution center, and those costs are not invisible. We can't sweep them under the rug. We have to account for them through what we call fixed cost absorption. That means that each unit that we produce absorbs a percentage of the fixed cost. And so the more units that we produce and we sell, the smaller the dollar amount that each unit has to absorb. So from a manufacturing standpoint, then introducing a car at $30,000 that's branded Mercedes had a significant positive impact on the financials of that business. Their profit increased dramatically. But from a marketing standpoint, what they did was they eroded the equity that they had in a high-end luxury automotive. Because you can't be a car that's branded Mercedes that sells for $125,000 and then a car that sells for $30,000. Well, which one? You, so you have, what, this is some type of bipolar brand? What is, um, you know, marketing? If we say, what is marketing? Marketing is about creating, communicating, and delivering value. That's what marketing is, the essence of marketing. Right? We could spend a whole semester, we could spend several semesters talking about what marketing is. But in essence, we could distill it down to those three components. Creating, communicating, and delivering value. So that kind of begs the question, what is value? What do you think value is? If marketers are responsible for creating value, what is it? What's, what's value? I think it depends on the demographics. So it is, there is a, um, it does vary based on an individual, right? It's based on perception. So what is it that they're perceiving? Brand equity. Yes, the, but, and so what does the brand contain? What information does the brand contain? The perception of the brand. Right? Which would be, for, like what, for example? That would indicate value. What, it is, what is it about, what does the brand name communicate that would suggest value? Luxury, high-end, something exclusive. So it could be, but what about something like uh, quality? When we say what is value, value is a function of quality. <laughs> so if we're going to evaluate something and determine whether or not the product has value. We have to consider the level of quality. And what about the, the benefits, the features of the product? And also... I think it's difficult to say because, for example, really, like, the reason I say it depends on your target, it depends on your audience, because I also think it has to do with culture. For example, I use a certain brand of cleaner for my house. 
And the reason I use it is because my grandmother used it, my mother used it, so I used it. And I've never seen a commercial or an advertisement for this product, but I know to use it because it's been passed on. So, I, to me, I don't think it's so much where, you know, like I won't use Thai, I'll use this product called Suavitel, or I won't use Downy because I'll use Suavitel, or I won't use Lysol because I'll use Fabuloso. I think that's what it, it's right. for me as a consumer. And so what is, um, how do we take that into account when we think about value? Well, is one, it uh, brand preference? Brand preference, and one, it is cheaper than, you know, a downy or a top. So price. price. Absolutely. So price. So we could say that value is a function of the price, the benefits, and the quality. And when we say price, when we talk about value, we got to make a distinction that it doesn't mean low price. So something is a good value because it provides, let's say, um, a certain level of quality. Now, if the quality is very high and you have a significant number of benefits and the price is also high, then it's a good value. I think it's also, it depends on the, the, the brand. Like sometimes, you know, when you see someone that has on a mean brand, you know, shirt, jacket, purse, shoes, whatever, you know, it could be just that that person is maybe all about labels, just the fact that, you know, okay, it's a Louis Vuitton bag and it's got to, you know, last me the rest of my life and I paid six, seven hundred dollars for it, but you can probably get the same bag, you know, in a, a small, small boutique. You know, same thing, it's just it's not the name But to your point, we said that um, value is something that's subjective mm -hmm. to the consumer. So to each consumer, they have to decide if something is a value. They have to decide whether or not the quality and the benefits is enough to justify that premium pricing relative to other products. But it's not just one. Uh, I just want to be clear that when we say something is a good value, it's not just that, oh, it's cheap. It could be that the benefits are acceptable, the features are acceptable, the quality is acceptable, and it's a low price. That is a good value. But at the same time, something that has a very high quality and many benefits and many features that is double or triple or even ten times the price of the uh, competitive product could still be perceived as a good value. So you get what you pay for. So for example, Sony. Sony is much more expensive than uh, Panasonic or other brands, but the reason why they're able to get a premium for their product is because people believe, and in many cases it's true, that their products are of better quality. Did they come out with a, a did they only come out with a lower price model of their merchandise too? Well, companies could have um, a portfolio of brands mm -hmm. that target multiple price points. But this is the question, right, that you want to have addressed as it relates to Mercedes. What did they um, do wrong? A brand has what we call a certain level of brand elasticity. There's so far that you could stretch a brand. The question is, how far can you stretch a brand? Now, you can stretch a brand across multiple price points. That's okay, but the question is, how wide is the range? Now, with Mercedes, why did they, why were they able to sell so many cars, so many Mercedes branded cars, based on what we just talked about, for $30,000? Because people wanted to have Mercedes, but they might not have the money to buy a $60,000, 70000 So if they have thirty grand, they could buy Mercedes. And there's something, yes, and there's something a little bit more, like based on what we just discussed. What is it? What, what is the perception? It's Mercedes, that's why. It has the symbol, Mercedes-Benz. Value. There you go. It's a good value. 
Now remember, when they decided to introduce that level of quality vehicle, they knew they were going up against well-entrenched competitors, Toyota, Honda. So they decided to use the Mercedes brand, the Mercedes master brand, to penetrate that segment in the marketplace. And they sold a lot of cars at that price point because the perception was that it was a great value. Because people consciously, and maybe even more so subconsciously, believe that they're getting something that's worth $130,000 for $30,000. Because through advertising and other marketing communications, that's what Mercedes has convinced all of us to believe is that their brand equals luxury, prestige, high-end automotive. Now they're saying you could get a Mercedes for 30 grand. Why not? It's a great value. Right? You're getting, um, you're not, um, you're getting more than what you paid for. So you could buy a Mercedes for 30000 or you could buy a Mercedes for 130000 And that ties back to the issue of value, which is at the heart of marketing, which is, like you said, different people have different perceptions of a product or a service. It's somewhat subjective, but ultimately what they're deciding is whether or not it's a good value. And there's people who buy Mercedes for $130,000, and they perceive that to be a good value. That they're getting a certain level of performance, they're getting a certain level of quality, and for them, they believe that that's a good value. And there's others that believe that Toyota is a, is a good value. But again, you get you get what you pay for. So share with us what you think about. Um, no, I was really scared for Toyota too because they also did a subdivision for the lower end cars, and they were successful. But I don't see why Mercedes couldn't do the same thing. So explain that a little bit further. Well, they have the Scion brand that was totally brand new, and you know, it's for the lower end, younger generation. And Toyota's brand was being like it's being old, and like people think it's an old brand now. So they came out with a Scion to, you know, it has the value of a Toyota, but it's also for younger kids or younger adults. So I don't see why Mercedes, they should have kept the Mercedes at, oh, this is a $60,000 Mercedes. This is also a Mercedes, but it's, you know, they, they consciously you think that, oh, it does have a backing of Mercedes, but it's also not really affecting the brand Mercedes itself. Oh, it's Lexus, the same thing. Yeah, it's Lexus, too. Yeah. There's three levels in a brand hierarchy. There's a corporate brand, a master brand, and a sub-brand. Toyota Motor Sales USA is the corporate brand. But Toyota Motor Sales USA also has several master brands. One of their master brands is Zion, one of them is Toyota, and one of them is Lexus. So what they did was something really brilliant. What Mercedes did is something different. Toyota says, yeah, I got it. There's a lower end of the automotive market. There's a, a middle of the market. And there's a higher end automotive market and even an ultra luxury segment. And they methodically and very systematically sought to penetrate each one of those segments. But they said, you know, some of our students took Professor Bissell's marketing course. And this is our takeaway. We can't be all things to all people. Our brand has to be focused and represent a certain price range a certain level of quality, a certain number of benefits and features. So they said, 
we understand we could be at multiple price points. So they introduced the Toyota, which was for the middle market, and they introduced the Toyota Echo, the Toyota Corolla, the Toyota Camry, the Toyota Solara, the Toyota Avalon, all at different price points. So it's not that Mercedes introduced a car at a different price point. You can, but think about this. The range of price points for Toyota from Echo to Avalon is from about, let's say roughly 15,000 to about 40,000. They're all Toyota, but they have different sub-brands. Echo, Corolla, Camry, those are all um, sub-brands that are associated with the master brand. But when they wanted to sell the upper end of the market, they did this brand elasticity research. And they found out for themselves that there's only so far you could stretch the brand. Consumers said, 55000 for a Toyota? No. We'll, we'll, buy a, we'll buy an Echo. We'll even buy an Avalon, which is a really nice car. But if we're going to spend fifty fifty five thousand, 55000 I, I wouldn't buy a Toyota. There's other brands that are in their consideration set. So Toyota learned that they needed a new brand to penetrate that segment. So they created the Lexus master brand to penetrate that segment. And they used the same branding strategy when they decided to penetrate the lower end of the market. So they did, they stepped down. They wanted to sell to a lower price point segment, just like Mercedes. But they utilized a different they created a new master brand, the Zion, to penetrate that segment because they didn't want to devalue the Toyota master brand, which they spent billions, billions, it's not an exaggeration, over 25 years that they've been in the U.S. market, they literally spent billions of dollars in marketing communications, communicating that this car is, you know, middle of the road, middle market, Twenty to forty thousand dollar price point. Well, now that they decide they want to sell ten thousand dollar cars, they realize that they needed another master brand to do that. Now they were faced with the same dilemma as Mercedes. They would have sold a lot, right? They would have sold a lot of Toyota cars at ten thousand dollars. Why? Why would they sell a lot of cars at ten thousand dollars? If they came out with a Toyota that was priced $10,000, instead of calling it Zion, they just came out with a new Toyota and it was $10,000, why would they sell a lot? It's value. Right, it's a tremendous value. The perception is that you're getting something that has better quality, better features, better benefits for a very low price. That's the ultimate win-win. Like I said before, there could still be a great value in paying $130,000 for a car as long as you're getting the quality, the performance, and the features, and the benefits, people will see that as a good value. But the, the, the best case scenario is that you get the quality, the features, and the benefits at a low price. Well, how, <laughs> how could you ask for anything more? That's the, the ultimate value. So their branding strategy was very different from what Mercedes did. They decided that they would have a master brand for each price point segment in the market. The lower end of the market, the middle market, and the higher end of the market. Zion, Toyota, and Lexus. That's very different from what Mercedes did. They're trying to stretch their brand from 30000 to 130000 now, once you start selling Mercedes at $30,000, how happy do you think the customers are 
that we're buying Mercedes for $130,000 are going to be. Yeah, you're... People, let's not kid ourselves. If you're buying a Mercedes, part of what you're buying is definitely the prestige. That's absolutely an intangible benefit that they're marketing. And people don't know the difference between C-Class, E-Class, S-Class. All people know is that symbol, that Mercedes symbol. That's what people recognize. And when you drive down um, a block and you're looking up people's driveway, that's all you see is that symbol. He's got a Benz, she's got a Benz, she's got a Benz, he's got a Benz. So now if you bought yours and you're like, well, wait a minute, I bought mine for 130. That's a problem. Yeah. You, can't, you can't be all things to, to all people. If either you're a high-end luxury brand or you're not. If you want to reposition yourself and start selling cars at $30,000, okay, that's fine. But you can't also sell, expect to sell cars $100,000 at a price tag that's $100,000 more than your lower, lowest price model. People might not have the same features as the higher end. Mercedes, like you might not have the wood grain, the heated seats, or the top of the line, you know, leather. I mean, you'll have the Mercedes sign and symbol, but you can probably have, you know, Hyundai parts. I don't know. So, but the thing is that, true, true, but most people, <laughs> most people don't, most people don't realize that. I mean, did it, Hyundai just came out with a vehicle, a higher end vehicle that I didn't even, I saw it one time on the street, I couldn't even figure out what kind of car it was. It's a Genesis. Yeah. And it, they had no Hyundai symbol, and it looked like a, a Bentley or something. Yeah, it looks like a five-story thing. Yeah. But they used a different master brand. Hyundai? No, they just didn't put their labeling on. They didn't put the H sign on it, that specific H that they have. There was nothing, like, nothing no So brand. if it just says Genesis, that means that they have a new master brand. No, they didn't even oh, have no, that. It's just a Hyundai Genesis. Genesis. I mean, it's part of Hyundai. Yeah. But I think their strategy is different. They're trying to get the people that were buying fifty thousand dollars to buy the car at thirty thousand. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the opposite of Mercedes. Yeah. They're trying to alter people's perception. Yeah. Right. Why is the position mm -hmm. yeah. not, well, not really different, but because Hyundai is from the bottom, they're trying to come up. But Mercedes is from the top, oh, yeah, and they're yeah, trying to come yeah. down. Yeah. I was going to check right. it, just going down. <laughs> <laughs> so Hyundai, that's, that's a good point. What they're trying to do is add value to their product and to charge more. Right. To come out with a better product. Um, they've been in the U.S. for a little more than 20 years or so. When they first introduced the uh, Hyundai Excel, it was a $7,000 car that was with these little plastic parts. It was kind of like a toy car, almost. <laughs> And, um, but they've improved the quality of their cars, and they, yeah, they, they, they have a, an excellent warranty program, and they've increased the price, which is different from a penetration pricing strategy, which means that you start, um, you bring a product to a market at a low price to penetrate the market quickly. But once you do that, you can't raise the price after that. Once you start selling the, the item at a low price, nobody wants to pay more now. But that's different from what Hyundai did. Because they're not trying to sell the same product and charge more. They're trying to sell a different product under the same brand name and get more money for that. That's different from a penetration pricing strategy. A skimming strategy is you start at a high price and lower the price over time, which is like, for example, what they did with the iPhone. They introduced the iPhone at $600, and then a few months later, actually a few weeks later, right, literally, they um, dr dropped the price dramatically to increase sales. And now they've come out with another um, another iPhone. Right. 3G, 3GS. 
But really just different software, it's not a thing you can You could up update like your old iPhone with the, you know, the software. I actually tried to do it today, but the server had crashed with I Apple, so got away a little while. But one of them, one of the versions of the 3GS has, um, it's not just the software, yeah, it's you can um, update, update the software, which has some un new features for the iPhone, like you could forward um, text messages, copy and paste, mm -hmm. but the, uh, the, the new model, the 3GS, is, um, has a faster yeah. internet access, which is supposed to be twice as fast as the, uh, as the prior model. And they have video. Doesn't it? Can't you do short videos with the with the new uh, iPhone? Mm -hmm. And it's a 32 gigabyte hard drive. Yeah. 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 It's more than a computer it used to be. <laughs> yeah, all in all in the palm of your hand. Did you get one already? No, not yet. Nadia, I'm still trying to get them to fix my uh, my 3G 16 gigabyte one <laughs> that it mysteriously stopped working. That I that one I've only had for three four months, and the escape button stopped working. All right. So to recap, we said marketing is about creating, communicating, and delivering value. You said value is a function of price, quality, and benefits. And when we talk about some of the basic activities of marketing, there's five key activities in marketing. The first is to identify an unmet need in the marketplace. The second is to, to develop a product to meet that need. Third is to determine a price that the consumer is willing to pay. And fourth is to gain distribution which means to get on the shelf at Walmart or Target or Rite Aid. And fifth is to build awareness. And the order is important because you don't want to start advertising and the product not be on the shelf, which very often, um, that's a problem. Right. Some companies, they're, they jump the gun in trying to create some hype for their product, and then consumers go into the store, the product is not there, they're, they're frustrated. Now in some categories, that's acceptable, like in entertainment, um, consumers consider that to be acceptable, but in most cases, people aren't gonna just keep going back and checking to see, did it come in yet? Unless it's a very high involvement product. Like so what? Yeah, like so. What that means is that you're gonna have to spend another twenty-five million dollars to advertise and get people to get off their couch and to to drive to Walmart. Yeah. So the five key activities are identify the need, the unmet need in the market, d develop a product, determine the price, gain distribution, and build awareness. That's what we're focusing our time and energy in doing. And there's four key variables that are in our toolkit, which is the marketing mix, known as the four P's. Product, price, place, and promotion. Those are the four powerful tools that we have at our disposal that we could use to influence the product life cycle. What are the key stages of the product life cycle? Who remembers? Introduction. Introduction is the first stage. But before we get to maturity, growth, then maturity, decline, and obsolescence. Now it's important for us to understand that model even though the length of time that we, our product will spend in each stage will vary, the key takeaway is that us as business people, as managers and marketers, can influence that by changing the marketing mix. 
<laughs> so, for example, what does that mean? How do we sustain growth? Right, so it's not a foregone conclusion, that bell curve. The exciting part is that we control that. We manage that life cycle. It doesn't manage us unless we let it. So how do we sustain growth? Because that's what we want to do is we introduce the product at time zero, at sales level zero, and then sales grow. Sales are increasing over time, week one, week two, week 20, and we want sales to continue to, to grow. So one of the things that we could do in a price sensitive market, in an elastic market, is we could lower the price. And if we lower the price in an elastic market, sales are going to continue to increase. We're going to continue to sell more units. Like what, for example? What would be a good example of an elastic market, one that is price sensitive? What products can you think of that, if you lower the price, that iPhone. <laughs> the iPhone? Yeah. The iPhone is a is a good example. Game consoles. TVs. Foot. Laser eye surgery. Which one? Laser. Basic eye surgery. So. Airline tickets. Right. It's good. It's good examples. What about those that are not price sensitive, where if the price goes up or the price goes down, it's basically inelastic. Yes. Yes. So most types of um, necessities. commodities or, or necessities, like Energy. electricity for example. If Con Edison increases the price of electricity 30%, what do we do? Yes. That's it? Run home, shut off all the lights? Solar panel. <laughs> right? Renewable energy. That's it. We're, we've had enough. We're going to get those solar panels, and we're going to do the socially responsible thing, right? We're going to be good, um, green citizens. good, that's right, we're going to be green, green citizens. We're going to show that we have a sense of responsibility towards our community well, this New York. and our environment. Trends <laughs> going up at the end of the month, and we're still going to pay it no matter what. It'll be to the 225, starting June 28th. Get the right. bikes up. <laughs> what about what about medication, for example? So if they increase the price of your uh, your blood pressure medication, thirty percent, fifty percent, where you stop taking your pills. And and conversely, if they lower the price of your heart medication fifty percent, but you don't start taking twice as many now, right? <laughs> or with electricity, you don't start running the AC in the winter, <laughs> right? Oh, it's the price of electric has gone down. But consumption hasn't uh, increased. So we need to understand when we, the product and service, and determine whether or not it's being sold in a market that's elastic or inelastic. And Price could be, if it's an elastic market, price could be a powerful tool that we could use to um, sustain the rate of growth. Or, for example, the, uh, one of the P's is promotion, which is also code for advertising. So we could increase the level of advertising expenditure. We could spend more money on advertising. Wouldn't that be dependent on also, like, for example, peaks, like advertising, isn't that, there aren't there peaks for advertising? Like, for example, Super Bowl, we see everyone's just like lining out with their new advertisements and their new promotions and stuff like that. Well, there's, in terms of viewership, um, during the Super Bowl this year, there were 200 million people in the U.S. that were watching the Super Bowl. And there were no American car commercials. Or the, Super Bowl. No. the cost of a, of a Super Bowl ad is, um, is quite expensive. So for, um, 
a uh, 15 second spot in the Super Bowl is $3 million. Wow. So 15 seconds. So the question is, we have to decide that and weigh the trade-offs between reach and frequency with our advertising. So is it better to reach 200 million people one time, or is it better to reach 200,000 people eight times? Now it really depends on your brand. If it's a new brand, you'd be better off with the greater frequency and a smaller audience. You'd be better off having fewer people see a commercial, but have them see it more times. Because to be exposed to an ad one time is not enough. You don't process the messaging. Most times we don't even know, like, was that a commercial for Pepsi? Or what? <laughs> because remember, 15 seconds and it's gone. Even if it's a 30 second spot. Because remember, during that 30 seconds, what's going on? You're texting your professor, you're um, talking to your friends, you're sending emails. But isn't it also depend? It depends on the advertising, though, too. If it's catchy and it's funny, it's something you remember. That's our challenge as yeah. advertisers and marketers mm -hmm. is to break through the clutter. Because remember, again, there's our 15-second spot, and then there's the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one, and a minute and a half later. You've already watched six. <laughs> right. You, you've already you've seen six commercials, and we're trying to sit there and think. Well, what was the first commercial about? Mm -hmm. What were they selling? What brand was it? Most people are not that engaged. For students or um, marketing and advertising professionals, they watch and they study and they observe carefully. Their level of, uh, of attention is very high. But most people, they see the commercials as an intrusion. They want to skip the commercials. Nobody wants to watch the commercials. But it's advertising that funds the programming. The reason that programming was developed is as an excuse to show advertising. Procter & Gamble, they um, created soap operas, as we know them today, to sell laundry detergent and other household cleaning products to women that were working out of the home. That's the reason for creating um, programming, for creating um, sitcoms and... Jerry Springer. <laughs> right. For Jerry Springer and other talk shows and so forth is so that you could sell advertising. <clears throat> and we said that there's three levels in a brand hierarchy corporate brand, the master brand, and the sub-brand. And the brand is what's wrapped around the product. What's in this bottle? Gold. Carbonated sugar water. Right? <laughs> what gives this product, exactly, what gives this, this product meaning is this logo and symbol. Exactly. We all are So the there's a number of branding elements. One of them is the brand name, which in this case is Pepsi. And these are things that we decide as business managers. We have to decide what is the brand name for our product. What is the logo, which is a non-word mark, no, I'm sorry, the logo is a word mark, the symbol is a non-word mark, right, this graphic here, which has been recently updated and they also changed their logo, the symbol contains no words. What's incredible about that is that anywhere around the world, people recognize that symbol as representing Pepsi, without words. And it would be very presumptuous of us to think that everywhere around the world people can read the Latin alphabet, that they could read English. That's just not the case.
but yet we have a brand that we want to sell everywhere in the world. So there's certain um, elements when we're building a brand, and brands are very unique, they have very complex personalities, there's several key branding elements. The brand name, the logo, the symbol, the tagline, and the slogan, the tagline and the slogan are not the same. Packaging is also a good example of a branding element. Why do I say the tagline and the slogan are not the same? Because the tagline is what, it's a short phrase, usually very short, no more than three or four words, that's associated with the logo and the symbol. Right, well that for Nike has an interesting history, but we'll come back that, to that in a second. The slogan is simply the theme for an advertising campaign. And that could change. <laughs> That's it, huh? All right, feel, feel well. Thanks, we'll see you. The, the slogan is the advertising theme for a campaign which can change every three to six months. Because consumers get tired of seeing the same commercials again and again and again. Right? They some of them even become annoying. Right? But the um, the the tagline is something that's more enduring. Once you come up with that short series of words that embodies your brand, then you stay with that. Unless you want to reposition your brand. So that's something that you wouldn't change um, more than every five years. Or maybe you wouldn't want to keep the same tagline for 10 years or 20 years. As long as it still represents and embodies what your brand means or what you want it to mean to your customers. So that's not something that you change every three months. Slogans, remember, those are just the themes for ad campaigns. Those you change. Because every ad campaign, you want to show a different dimension of your brand, a different facet of your brand and your products. So that could change, but not, not the tagline. Often people get a little um, unclear as to the distinction of the two. They're, they're not the same. Now there's four key branding elements. So when we're def defining but we're deciding what the brand name is going to be, what the logo is going to be, what the tagline is going to be, the slogan. We have to use certain criteria to determine whether or not it's an effective brand name or if it's an effective logo or symbol. So these are some key brand um, criteria. The first is the branding element has got to be memorable which means that it's got to be unique. And it's unique enough that people are going to remember it. Or that they're going to recognize it when they see it. Because one of the things that we want to achieve is a high level of brand awareness. But there's two types of brand awareness. Brand recognition and brand recall. Brand recognition means that you recognize the logo and the symbol when you see it, usually at the point of purchase, in the store, on the shelf. But that's different from brand recall. Brand recall means that you're able to retrieve from your memory the brand name. So when you go down the road there to Applebee's and you say um, you'd like to place your order, and they say, okay, what would you like to drink? There's, they're not holding up any kind of flash cards or anything. Pepsi, Sierra Mist. Right? You're there, you have to retrieve that from your memory. You go, uh, <laughs> whatever, whatever, what? Whatever, what? Okay. They say, uh, no, we don't, oh, I'm not familiar with that brand. Fanta? Fanta? So what are some brands? Let, let's talk about um, beverages. Let's go around the room and I want you to tell me some, some brand names for, for beverages. Who, who's going to start? 
Ja, yeah, jetzt? Yeah. Okay, André? Sunkiss, tastes like Friday even on Monday. Ha! <laughs> no, that's all me. I, I know, that's awesome that you remember that. <laughs> Smart water. Smart water. Yeah. <laughs> Who's their uh, spokesperson? Yeah. Who, 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 who? Vodka. You know what vodka is, right? <laughs> the students consume alcohol? No. <laughs> not not here, right? Not on Wednesdays. Only soft drinks, right? Fanta. Fanta. Gatorade. Nasty. Mmm, yum. Snapples. Snapple. I never got the nasty part. Like, how do you, like, nasty, you know? <laughs> like, how do you name them? Nasty. Irish. It's nasty, you know? Oh, is that one? Yeah, it's produced by uh, Nestle, so they formed that conjugation. It's tea, so it's Nestle. Yeah, brilliant, right? But this is the thing. When it comes to determining a brand name, it's not so important to pick a brand name that has some sort of subliminal or implied meaning. That's not going to get you very far. It's cute. It's interesting if you come up with something, a brand name that's a little catchy or implies something. But the only way that you're going to have a meaningful impact in building your brand and creating associations is through advertising. It's not by some cutesy little brand name or term that you come up for as your brand name that's going to give you forward momentum that's going to make you successful, that's going to um, allow you to sell a large number of units. It's the associations that you build with that brand name. Like for example, what is, um, what does Mercedes-Benz mean? Like, there's nothing implied there. As far as I know, it doesn't, it's like, doesn't translate to something that means fast or high performance or anything to even do with cars at all. But the reason why, to all of us here, even for those of us who are not car enthusiasts, why it means something is because they spend billions of dollars in communicating that Mercedes is a high-end luxury car. Some companies, they spend an enormous amount of time trying to come up with a brand name. <coughs> I'm not familiar with that one. <laughs> For example, there's a video segment that we could watch about a censure. Oh, gosh. A what? <laughs> it's a consultant firm, Accenture. They had Tiger Woods as their spokesperson. Yeah, Accenture, they, um, they spend an enormous amount of time coming up with thousands of brand name alternatives, which really is not productive. Most people, even if you're like a you know, uh, an English major or, you know, spelling bee guru or what have you, most people don't know that, what Accenture means. Like it... <laughs> innovative thinking. That's a nice slogan, innovative thinking. Yeah, but the Accenture has something to do with um, excellence and... Accentuating your business and making it go for, yeah, because my job here is Accenture Consultants. <laughs> But that doesn't, um, that doesn't help them. What helps them is those campaigns, like you're saying, and those um, slogans that they use in advertising about innovative thinking and so forth. That's what gives the brand value. That's what gives the brand an identity. Not like um, the fact that the brand name has some sort of implied meaning. People don't, people don't shop like that. Business people, or consumers. No, but if you're a senior executive, you're not going to say, I wonder what that means. Let me Google this. Let me go onto some online thesaurus or something and figure out, oh, Accenture, oh, that's deep. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's deep. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
But they actually, they spent, they had a contest in their organization. They actually, what's interesting is they hired a very well-known branding company to come up with brand names, but they also ran a contest in the organization and they generated literally thousands of brand names. But again, that's meaningless if you're not advertising. Because that's the way you're going to build an identity for your brand. That's how you're going to create a, a brand personality, is through advertising. I think it's great that they got the employees involved. There was a participative management process. That, I think, is, is great. But that, because that'll help employees get motivated and be engaged and so forth, but that there's some value in the name itself is uh, not the case. But, so we want a, a brand name that's memorable. And it doesn't, it could be a, um, a, a name that we create. That's fine. In fact, it would be better because the second criteria that we're going to use is the protectability of the branding element. Right, so is it something that you could trademark? You can't keep people from using the word Google. Google? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Google, you can. Um, I'll, exp I'll tell you why in a minute. But like the word Tide. Now, Tide is the number one market share laundry detergent in the U.S. You can't keep people from using the word Tide. What you could keep people from using is the the lettering, the fonts that they use, right? Their logo. People can't just you replicate their logo. Like the big T and the black. Right. Like so somebody can call it Tide, but have a slightly different brand. No, not slightly different. It's got it would have to be very, <laughs> very different. Like it's got to be in script. Right. And so the thing is, that's the thing about the protectability is that, and in selecting, for example, a brand name or developing a logo, is that. You have to keep in mind that it's something that you would want to be protectable, that you could have a trademark and that other people can't um, infringe upon. Coca-Cola Red. Mm -hmm. Well, the red is part of um, Coke's trade dress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So some companies have co colors that are associated with their brand. It's not a requirement as part of a branding strategy, but if you have color that's um, closely associated with your brand, it could be very compelling. Yellow for Kodak. The the packaging, for example. None of us want to admit it, but you know that once you when you go into a store, you could be ten aisles away, you see this out of the corner of your eye, you know that it's Pepsi. Right? You can't help it. We try not to watch the commercials. We try to tell ourselves we're not gonna be brainwashed, but you know, you don't have to admit it in front of the class. <laughs> but I know that you know that I know that, <laughs> that when you see this packaging out of the corner of your eye in the store, that, you're gonna, that you know that this is the, the Pepsi brand. But how about the cap? Also, the, the cap is yellow. That, that, that's a way that you can recognize that it's a Pepsi or a red cap that's gold or a green cap Mountain Dew. Aren't the yellow caps for culture, though? That's what I don't know. Because yeah. I know... It's for Passover. Right. But that's only during that time. Is it? It's, a, it's done, yeah. It's done like April, May. But that, you're it's right. It's a bad guy. Yeah. Word. It's kosher. Did they do that for Coke, too? Yeah. I know it on Coke, not on Pepsi. I know it on Coke, yeah, that they have the yellow caps. Yeah, I think all the Coke products that have yellow caps for kosher for Passover. Interesting. No, not just kosher <laughs> regularly, because they're not... It's not... It's made kosher. Yeah, that's what I thought. It was already... But they replaced yeah, the... That's the high fructose syrup with... You know. Yeah, with sugar foam. Which is helpful. And that's why the packaging, when we advertise, whether it's in a, a magazine or on television, why we want to show the packaging. Because we want people to recognize the packaging when they see it at the point of purchase. When people... Um, when people go to the store, we want them to take the product off the shelf and just put it in their cart. 
it's a planned purchase, or even if it's an impulse purchase, they see it and immediately they identify the product and all these positive attributes and benefits and features come to mind. So we want the, the logo, we want the symbol, we want the brand name to be something that's protectable. Because this graphic is trademarkable. People can replicate that. If they do and they use it, then it will be infringing on the Pepsi trademark. They can't use this, um, this logo. Now, this logo, though, what do you think? What do you think about this logo? Pepsi. Right, where it says Pepsi, the lettering. It's too small. Do you think... It's not bold enough. Is it, is it something that you think is unique? Mm -hmm. Is there more that they could do to make it protectable? Yeah. Right, the font, it just looks like Arial font, which is very different from the very stylized Coca-Cola logo. Right, that is unmistakable, the script um, font. That's something that we need to take into account. We need to have a logo that's, of course, you want it to be readable, but it's stylized enough, it's unique enough that others can't copy it. So the more unique, the more stylized, the more protectable it is. <coughs> and so other people can't use your logo. Because remember, if it's a word like Tide, anybody could call their product Tide. You can't, keep, you can't trademark words that are in the dictionary. Now Pepsi is not a word that's in the dictionary. So somebody can't um, introduce a product and name it Pepsi or name it Kodak. Or what are some other some other brands that? Uh, which one? Snapple. Snapple, right? McDonald's. No, but that's that's a good. Too large. Not even McDonald's. Like coming to America. What was that? McDonald's. Nobody ever saw coming to America. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't McDonald's. He was McDonald's. <laughs> No, I, I don't remember that. Eddie Murphy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The king of some um, African uh, nation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 I'm curious. Burger I have to watch that. So Burger King, what do you think? Is that a good brand name? No. Burger. <laughs> king. Burger King. <laughs> you, can't, you can't keep people from using those, um, those words. But what they did that's unique is they incorporated their logo and symbol into one. So the words burger and king are an angle and it's between two buns. Right? That's very unique. But what about, what was the one that you had mentioned? McDonald's? No, the other one that you were saying before. Google or Snapple? Google. Yeah, Google. Okay, this is the thing about Google. The way that Google spells their brand name is different from the mathematical term, which is what I was think, I, was what I think you were alluding to, which is a Google, which is I forget what it is like a very large, a very large <laughs> number, right? It's a very large number, which is spelled different than the way their brand is spelled, right? So their brand name is spelled in a unique way. Even though it's pronounced the same, it's, um, it's spelled a different way. What about like Ikea? Or Ikea is not a word in the dictionary. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's unique. Well, then you also have the new one, the ping. Ping? Mm -hmm. Yeah, ping. That's just trying to be in competition with the Google. Oh. Ping. And the, the letters look like the Pepsi letters. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I saw that. I'm thinking, ping. I don't. That might be a word that's in the in the dictionary. Firefox. 